Right, hi guys, and welcome back to the Cruel Corner. We're here once again in this wonderful ranty corner for all things Formula E. So, round number two at Diria, of course, round three in the championship itself has come to a close. And after the doubleheader weekend, it's... <sighs> this season, ten seasons, not looking fantastic at the moment, is it? It must be said. Unfortunately, um, yeah, another rather dull race. Uh, some good overtakes at times, though. Uh, particularly from the cars that were higher up the order than expected to be again. Uh, that tumbled down in the later stages. Some good moves put in there. Some good strategies, once again, with the attack mode. Again, like last season, it seems like the later you take attack mode, the better it actually is. As opposed to the other way around, like it used to be of the Gen 2 era. Um, but yeah, overall, you know, there's a championship there to be won. There's one driver out there that's doing absolutely sublime at the minute, and all the others seem to be having a good result, and then at the minute, just a couple of mundane or bad races. So, uh, yeah, there's one that's stringing it all together, and the rest of the field need to get their act together, don't they? Um, yeah, but without further ado, let's take a look at the current scoreboard. It's on the screen now for you to take a look at. Of course, that is just purely based on what I have awarded for the previous two rounds. The pecking order will start to find itself as we go on through the season, of course. But, uh, yeah, I think you know what's coming after this race in particular. There's not really much to talk about the race itself. There's a couple of drivers that had some good moments and some bad moments, which we'll get into. Uh, but for the most part, the race was rather mundane again, a bit like a Mexico. So I don't think I'll need to go into too much detail about what happened and what the drivers did, because pretty much where they qualified was pretty much where they finished, really. Uh, but, yeah, take a look at the current scoreboard, see where your favourite driver is, and can you see him going up or going down? as uh, I award each driver's score throughout this race. So as always, before we kick things off, I'd just like to announce that we have a competition still going on to win this lovely Neo 333 Season 5 presentation car from Mini Champs. So if you left a comment in yesterday's video, then you're already entered. Congratulations. But if you'd like two entries, drop a comment in this episode as well, as well as leave a like and be subscribed to the channel. That's all I ask. That is all I ask. So yes, there you go. You're in with a chance of winning that. <clears throat> if you watch this far... Then yeah, drop a comment down below. Something related to Formula E. I don't want any old bollocks. Put something related to Formula E in the comment section below. What's your favourite race? What's your favourite moment? Who's your favourite driver? Something like that. And uh, of course, like the video and be subscribed. So if you've done that already on yesterday's video, congratulations. You're still in with a shout. And if you're watching it now, drop another comment, drop another like. And of course, stay subscribed. And uh, you've got double the chance of winning. Announcement I'll make in the comment section. Uh, Mighty Kane, you won the last one from the Mexico City E Prix. So uh, again, get in touch if you haven't already. Um, yes, this one is going to be based on the two races. So of course, there's one winner. And uh, they will be winning that. And I'll let you know in the comments section. So keep an eye out for that. I will reply to you. And then I'll pin a comment, which will be my own. That will have the email address that you need to send me your contact details to. And I'll get that in the post to you. There we go. So without further ado then, let's kick things off with the race winner, of course, which was Nick Cassidy. What a stunning season he's had so far. Uh, what a way to start the season as well, let's be honest. A P3. A P3 and a P1. And this one comes courtesy with a fastest lap point as well due to Jake Dennis's penalty, which we'll come to in a moment. But it was Jake Dennis initially that had the fastest lap point and finished inside the top 10. But he was dropped outside the top 10, so that means that Nick Cassidy claimed the fastest lap point as well. Starting the race in P3... Uh, the Jaguar team elected to go for the, the attack modes late, which worked out perfectly. Uh, was able to beat Roland in the first set of attack modes, and then in the second lot of attack modes was in the lead, gained enough of a gap to take the attack and still come out in front of Robin Fright. So that worked out absolutely perfectly for him. And uh, yeah, all in all, it has been a sublime start to the season for Nick, hasn't it? I really, really rated him. I really wanted him to deliver the goods last season, and I, th I think he was capable of winning the championship last year, but that collision happened with Boemi, uh, his teammate in the penultimate race of the season, but he still did the job to get the team the title, didn't he? To get the team's title wrapped up for the uh, Envision squad last year. Uh, yeah, you know, Envision, I think, will be ruining losing uh, Nick Cassidy, but uh, Jaguar will be absolutely praising him. It's nice to see that they've got two drivers that can have the capability of being up there, although Mitch Evans has had a bit of a rough start, hasn't he? Uh, but nonetheless, Nick Cassidy so far, a P3 with a fastest lap, a P3 again, and then a P1 with a fastest lap point as well. 
well after some strong qualifying performances and as I mentioned at the start of the video there his nearest title rivals effectively are having one good race and they might scrape into the points further down the field and pick up a few but they're not picking up the big bulk of the points whereas Nick Cassidy Mr Consistency takes the championship lead and he's got a 19 point gap over Pascal Verlein, I think it is so uh, yeah you know that's a great start, that, isn't it? It really is. So, uh, Nick Cassidy, I'm going to give him 11. 11 points to him. He picks up that bonus point for Fastest Lap. He picks up a bonus point here as well. Um, it's, it's fantastic. He really has done well. So, uh, yeah, it's 11 points for me, personally. One bonus point to him. Really does deserve it. And uh, congratulations, Nick Cassidy, on a superb start with your Jaguar campaign. I really hope this momentum carries on. We've got quite a gap now to Sao Paulo, of course, with the Hyderabad race being cancelled in between, which is a shame because that provided a good race last year and uh, means that there's not a bigger gap in the calendar if it was there as well, of course. But uh, nonetheless, when it returns in Sao Paulo, I'm sure Nick Cassidy will be looking to extend that championship lead even further. But for now, it's 11 points and a cracking victory to Nick Cassidy. In second place, we come to Robin Frights in the Envision car. So it's nice to see Robin Frights actually have a good race after a good qualifying as well. Lining up P2, not quite able to beat Ollie Rowland in the duels, uh, meant that he lined up second place and uh, got off to the good start, really. Uh, was uh, in second throughout the most part. And then was, did he take the lead briefly, I think, when Ollie Rowland went for his first attack? He was one of the first to take attack. And then at that situation, then Cassidy got him on the attacks as well. These top three jumbled round but it wasn't really as a result of an actual overtake on track it was all due to the timings of the attack modes and when they went through it and then that's how the, the order lined up really. Uh, it did look at one stage though that Robin France was going to re-lose out to Ollie Rowland because Ollie Rowland was the first of the top three to take his second attack and then close right up to the back of Robin France again but then Robin before he went for his uh, second attack mode managed to pull a gap again so yeah did quite well there really did. Uh, good team with a strong qualifying, a great finish, P2 on the grid, P2 finishing position I'm sure he'd have wanted the win going into the race, especially when he thinks, well, I've got a Nissan ahead of me that's not done anything so far this season. It might drop off. And uh, he, he didn't. Ollie Rowland didn't drop off, but he had to watch out for Nick Cassidy as well. And he came steaming his way through. So fantastic effort. For Robin Fryance, after a strong qualifying and a strong race, I'm going to award him 8.5. Uh, I don't think he deserves a perfect 10. I think he's had a rough start to the season. This is a position I would expect him to be in. And uh, I think three races to get here is a little bit too long so it's a little bit of a punishment for what's happened in the previous races as well don't get me wrong uh, but yeah I think 8.5 is more than fair for what has been a solid result that was well needed it was necessary that he got this on the board wasn't it after such a rough start a shunt in um, of course in the first race in Mexico after a poor qualifying and just generally poor pace picks up the, the an odd point at the last race in Diria yesterday of course courtesy of Jake Hughes's uh, energy management and then here he is, finally getting on the podium after a strong qualifying. It's like the Envision Championship's gone in reverse, isn't it? Because we'll come to Sebastian Boemi in a minute. But, uh, yeah, these last three races have been a tale of two fortunes for both of those drivers. And, uh, yeah, just pleased to see uh, Robin Frantz finally get a deserved podium. So, 8.5 to him. And in third place, we come to Oliver Rowland in the Nissan. What a fantastic effort by him. So, Nissan had scored nil point in the first two races. And it is Oli Rowland picking up a P3 finish and as well to go with with that is the three bonus points for getting the pole position lap time in the qualifying rounds. He had a fantastic qualifying, didn't he? In the race itself, he led the way. He started quite well, but then was the first to take the attack mode. And as mentioned, then it enabled the cars ahead of, uh, of course, Cassidy and uh, Frantz to build the gap on him. So when he took the second attack mode, he almost lost out to Stoffel van Dorn, but didn't. So that was a crucial uh, moment, that of the race, for him to ensure that he stayed on the podium. Uh, reported that the balance of the car being a little bit weird at the start of the race. And also reported the lifting of potentially a turn 19 curb. Uh, nothing was ever done about that, so I don't know if it actually was... Uh, an issue or not but uh, yeah completely with rear balance and then suddenly was third and was quite happily third for the rest of the race so that was a decent effort by um, Ollie Rowland it must be said well done to him for that nice to see him back on the podium again for what feels like forever because he certainly got none at Mahindra last season did it so we must have to be looking at the season previous uh, before he was uh, last on the podium 
Great Steve. He's a great guy. I think he has got the uh, skill and ability to be in Formula E. I don't know what happened to Nissan uh, the first couple of races, but they just didn't really turn up, did they? And we've seen this before from Nissan as well. They seem to do well at a double header. They'll struggle in the first round, and then the second round they'll come back stronger, uh, which is quite encouraging because at least, you know, they've got chance to build momentum. Uh, they have done it previously last season. I can't remember what race it was. Was it the Jakarta double header that they were nowhere in round in the previous round, and then the next one that they were suddenly up there and in the points? So yeah, good to see uh, Ollie Rowland doing well. And for him, it's going to be nine points. Nine points, Ollie Rowland on the crawl room for him. Very good effort by Ollie Rowland there, and uh, great to see him do incredibly well. So yeah, nine points to him on the crawl corner. Next up, we come to Jake Hughes in the McLaren, securing his best ever finish in Formula E uh, with a P4, of course, beating his P5 of last season. Was that Monaco? I think he got that last season uh, after starting pole that race as well. Uh, but nonetheless, this time around, qualified P6, finished P4, got ahead of uh, Van Dorn due to strategy with the attack modes and got ahead of Jahan Darovella uh, due to strategy as well and also uh, Darovella's suffering of uh, struggling with regen and braking issues towards the end of the race meant he tumbled down the order anyway but yeah Jake Hughes has been fantastic this race he really really has a shame to see him miss out on that final points paying position last time out but this time around he got his act together got the qualifying done and got the job done in the race as well would have been lovely to see him on the podium but it wasn't to be but I'm sure if McLaren can keep this pace up of just solid and consistent only takes an, an issue for a car ahead or two and they're in there. So, uh, yeah, good to see uh, Jake Hughes back up here again and securing his best finish of the season. So, for Jake Hughes, it's nothing less than 10 points to me. I think he deserves the full 10. I think he got the maximum out of that McLaren car in qualifying and in the race. Uh, certainly a bravo effort from me. Well done. Really mature drive. Learned from yesterday and went forward in race two, which is all you can expect. And, uh, yeah, good effort. Well done, Jake Hughes. A perfect 10 to him. Finishing in fifth place, it is Stoffel van Dorn after qualifying in fourth. So that's not too bad. Dropping one place in a chaotic Formula E race and um, with all the attack modes and everything is fairly okay. You know, it's reasonable. Uh, good to see him up here. First strong race of the season, it must be said. He was awarded a uh, Lotterer of the Week, of course, in last round's uh, race. So, yeah, you know, here he is, picking up the pieces, doing a good job. Uh, double points finish for the uh, DS Pensy squad as well, which is decent. And short and sweet for Van Dorn, really, because there's not that much talk about his race other than just decent overall. It's going to be a solid eight to him. Solid eight to stop of Van Dorn for me, personally. Uh, I don't think it's anything to shout home or write home about. I think this is just doing the job he should be doing. It's just taken, again, a bit like... Uh, Comparing him to Robin Fright, just taking him a little bit longer than it should have done to get here. He should have been in this position from the word go. Extracted the maximum out of the race though. P4 start, P5 finish. Can't say fairer than that. 8 points to Stoffel van Dorn. In sixth place, we come to Sasha Fenestras in the other Nissan. So not only did Oli Rowland secure P3, but Sasha Fenestras also secured his first points of the season and make it a double points finish for the Nissan squad with sixth place and eight points on the board. Relatively straightforward for Sasha. Started sixth, finished sixth. It's easy peasy, really. Um, he drove well, drove clever, drove smart, didn't get anything wrong. This long la lane of cars, this long line of cars, just couldn't find the way around anyone else. And, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a shame to say, really, but the Formula E race so far, Formula E races so far, have uh, not really delivered what we're normally used to seeing in Formula E. I think everyone's got accustomed to the Gen 3 era now, so there's not as much chaos. The pecking order's already set. It's just a case of get a good qualifying Keeping that position, you're going to get points for the race. So, uh, Sasha Fenestras was proof of that. He gets sixth place in the race after qualifying sixth. It's going to be 7.5 for me personally. Good to see him back inside the points once again. Good to see Nissan having a good solid points finish there. Double points finish as well. So, that elevates them well up the order after scoring zero. They've got 20 odd points now, so that's good. And uh, yeah, hopefully, they can build that momentum forward going into Sao Paulo. We shall see. Um, plenty of work to do over the winter break though I say winter break, it's still winter for us isn't it But yeah, plenty of time to do over this off season now Due to not having Hyderabad uh, But yeah, for now, Fenestras, 7.5 
Then we come to Pascal Verlein in the Porsche. Wow, we were expecting them to be further up, weren't we? After such a great Mexico e Prix, it's come undone a little bit. Securing points, though, which is crucial because Pascal Verlein still maintains second in the overall championship, which is good. Again, it just proves how inconsistent everyone else has been as well. One cracking result and two races of just picking up points, but it's enough to maintain that second place in the standings. Uh, it's still early days, of course it is. We know it is with uh, Verlein and with Porsche. But it would have been nice to see him a little bit higher up in qualifying so he could at least um, gain some places in the race because he seems to be the only one or one of the few drivers that's able to charge through the field and secure points from a difficult qualifying position. I think he gained like five, six places this race. And uh, overall, you know, Pascal Verlein's going to be 6.5 to me. P7 finish, okay, it's points, it's okay, but it's nothing special, is it? We used to see him win and used to see him on the podium. And it just needs to get qualifying together, doesn't it? That's really the uh, the main bulk of it. So, uh, yeah, 6.52, Pascal Verlein. Then we come to jean eric Verne in 8th position. Qualified in 8th, stayed in 8th. Can't say fairer than that, really, can you? Again, a double points finish for the DS Penske squad, which is a good effort. It really is. Uh, first time that he's been outshone, so to speak, by uh, Stoffel van Dorn. But relatively in this pack, it's difficult to keep up. And I think he had the pace of his teammate. Just caught in this gaggle, couldn't do much overall. Uh, but yeah, good to see him do well. Uh, it must be said, again, jean eric Verne, I think, is quite up there in the championship because, again, he's just been missed to consistency picking up the points in all three races, whereas a lot of other drivers haven't managed that. So, uh, John Eric Verne, for me personally, I'm going to give him a solid 7 for that. Don't think he deserves as many as his teammate, but certainly doesn't deserve to be criticised. Did nothing wrong. He finished where he started. I don't think there's anything else he could do other than that. Um, there you go. That's really it, really. So, uh, yeah, John Eric Verne, a solid 7. Then we come to Maxi Gunter in the Maserati, uh, finishing P9. So again, another couple of points, and again, no mistakes from this driver that was stuffing it in the wall at every opportunity at the start of last season. I really do think him being there for that second season has given him the confidence, he's given him the, that self-belief in himself. He knows that the team is behind him, and I think he's come on leaps and bounds, as can be seen. Uh, qualifying wasn't his best. Uh, I think he was in the group that had the incident, though, wasn't he, with uh, Boemi? So I think he was knocked out in the heats. Did he qualify about 12th, something like that? And then in the race itself, was able to gain a couple of places inside that top 10 position and pick up a couple of points. So... Uh, yeah, I don't think there's anything more he could have done, to be honest with you, in that situation. I really don't. Gunter, you know, has had a strong start. Again, points in every race, that's all he can ask. I think he's got 20 on the board, and he's, of course, scored all of Maserati's points at the moment. So, yeah, good team inside the points once again. A little bit frustrating. I do think there is a little bit more in that Maserati car, but I think he's just in this no-risk situation at the moment. I'm the only one that's scoring the points. I need to make sure I score them, you know, and I think he has really took on that uh, leader role within the team and is taking it smartly and wisely. Would have been nice to see him a couple of places ahead, of course it would. I think that car is realistically a top six, top five finisher. Here he is finishing P9, though, and doing the job that he needs to do for now until Jahan gets up to speed. And uh, for me personally, it's going to be 6.5 to him. Uh, shame to see him miss out on the jewels, but again, that... I think that was the red flag, wasn't it, for Boehme? I'm sure he was in that session because Darovella was in the one that benefited, wasn't he, I think? Anyway, but nonetheless, uh, 6.5 to Gunter. Don't want to take anything away from what was a good drive, but uh, ultimately there was others around him that did a little bit of a better job, and I would like to see that Maserati a little bit higher up the order. Finishing in 10th place, we come to uh, Mitch Evans. Oh dear, after a poor qualifying, qualifying in 13th place. He was in Group A as well, so can't even use the excuse of uh, unfortunately got held up by the incident with Boemi in Group B. Uh, yeah, big, big shame, really. Picking up one point, that was a lucky point, of course, as well. Crossing the line 11th, elevated to 10th as a result of Jake Dennis's penalty, which we'll come to and discuss in a moment. Uh, yeah, Mitch Evans, though, lost his head last race out. We heard the team radio at the start of the build-up to this second round in Diria, where he was swearing down the radio and saying, you're going to shaft me, you're not being fair. You know, he really lost his head and lost his cool, while Nick Cassidy was saying, look, I'm happy to be P4, just let me get P3 briefly so I can take a free attack mode. That's all Cassidy wanted and that's all Jaguar wanted from Mitch. But he just obviously wasn't going into Mitch's head and he, he really thought that uh, they were out to shaft him already so early on in the season. Uh, been a rough start to uh, Mitch Evans' campaign so far. Two P5s and a P10. But again, at least it's points in every race, which is more consistent than others. But he would have wanted a lot more. He would have wanted to be up there with Cassidy, wasn't he? Three podiums, one of them a victory. 
that's what he's after and it's not come at the moment it was all his own fault in race two this time around a poor qualifying p13 on the grid elevates himself into a lucky points paying position so for mitch evans it's going to be three points to him for that can't go any fairer than that i'm afraid uh his teammates out there excelling Mitch Evans is losing his head, a little bit of pressure on his shoulders that he doesn't necessarily need to put on his shoulders. I don't think he's doing a bad job. I think he's just losing his head and thinking that all of a sudden Cassidy's the favourite in Jaguar. And the re he really isn't. He really isn't the favourite at all. I just think something's being in his bonnet already. Maybe something's happened behind the scenes. Uh, but ultimately, Mitch Evans at the moment is under-delivering for the car he's in. But at least he's scoring points. Uh, but for, for now, it's just three points to Mitch Evans. Just outside the points, we come to Eduardo Mortara in the Mahindra. A shame to see him just in P11. It would have been nice to see him scrape a point or two. But nonetheless, I think he's had a great race here this weekend. Uh, okay, the attrition was a little bit more higher this race, of course, from cars that were ahead of him. Um, so, you know, there's that to contend with. Of course, Jake Dennis's time penalty meant that he gained a position as well after crossing the line in P12. But gained seven places that race. And I don't think you can say fairer than that, really. In the Mahindra that is looking like the worst car on the grid, I'll still hold my hands against that. I would say that that Mahindra is looking very, very terrible. P P11, so close to points. I think they can all be really proud with that. And hopefully they can learn something after these first three races with the break that they've got now going into Sao Paulo. I think that they need to just understand, try and work with the car a bit, get the drivers in the sim, try and do something that will push that team a little bit more forward. Maybe they can get a point or two in a couple of rounds time. Who knows? But for now, Mortara did all he could with the equipment he's got. Again, he's kept it clean and tidy, not made any silly errors. And points are almost there. So, uh, yeah, they're coming for him. Again, a total contrast to what he was like last season. An absolute shunt monster, wasn't he? But this time around, he has been really clean, really consistent, and was so close to points this time around. So, for me personally, Eduardo Motari gets eight points on the crawl room uh, to him. I do think he's done the best job he can with the equipment he's got and was so close to points. Unlucky, but I'm sure they're going to come now. So, yeah, eight points to Eduardo Motara. Finishing in 12th place, we come to Jake Dennis. Uh, yeah, was not happy with that Andretti car at all throughout today. Uh, it was really, really surprising. The, the track temperature was a little bit higher. The ambient temperature was a little bit higher compared to yesterday. And, of course, the track was more rubbered in as well. Uh, but he said it was the worst Formula E car he has ever driven in qualifying. He was in that Group B category where uh, Sebastian Buemi crashed, which meant that you think, OK, Jake Dennis is a victim here. He's not been able to improve his lap time and get into the duels. He's lining up down in P14, I think it was. Uh, but Jake Dennis actually said, I'm glad that that happened because the, the Delta, I was up on my personal best, but I think we would have been beaten by everyone in that session. Uh, so his teammate Norman Nato ended up starting virtually the last this race due to him having the same issues as his teammate Jake Dennis. And Jake Dennis was thankful that he was able to start so high up because he just wasn't happy in the car. He wasn't comfortable in the car and he felt he was going to lose more play Places had that red flag not come out so uh, yeah breathing a sigh of relief there for, for not being last very very strange in the race itself he made some good moves he of course benefited from the likes of Sergio Sete Camera and Johan Darovala tumbling down the order uh, but was able to get ahead of Mitch Evans at one stage due to the attack mode strategy that Jaguar had used and was P10 but unfortunately on an unseen footage that I've not seen at the moment despite trying to look uh, he did overtake a car under the yellow flags which I believe was Mitch Evans in one situation that we didn't see um, yeah, so overtook the car under yellows, which meant he got a five cent time penalty. So after crossing the line in P10 and picking up a point, uh, unfortunately he drops himself down to P12. And not only does he lose that point for P10, he loses the point for fastest lap as well. So it would have been two points on the board to Jake Dennis, but as it stands, it was zero now. So a double whammy, so to speak, although two points is not that much. The way Formula E works, it could be quite crucial towards the end of the season, especially when it was Nick Cassidy that picked up the fastest lap point and Mitch Evans that picked up that one point for 10th place. You'd like to say that they're two of his main title rivals and they shared Jake Dennis's misfortune between them, really. So, yeah, shame to say, shame to see, but it wasn't a good race by Jake Dennis, so it's just three points to him for that. Uh, yeah, ultimately, he wasn't happy with the car, but I think a champion in Formula E, there should have been a lot more on the table. 
you know, when you get this kind of credibility and you get this ambition within you and you think Jake Dennis is a really good driver, he can drive anything, it's a bit like Max Verstappen, isn't it? He was complaining about the car in Singapore last year. It was still one of the best cars in, on the grid. You could see that in the race. He just lost his head because he didn't have opportunity for pole. Maybe Jake Dennis has gone that way as well. Maybe he's thought, well, the car's not quite good enough today. He overdrives it, he underdrives it, he underdelivers, and it suffers as a result. So, yeah, three points to Jake Dennis. Again, you know, might be a little bit harsh by a point or two there, but I feel at the end of the day we've got to go with what we know. He wasn't happy with the car, but at the same time, there's other drivers out there that have got really bad cars and are doing a lot better job in them. So, yeah, three, two, Jake Dennis. Then we come to Nico Muller in an unlucky for some P13. I don't think that's the first time I've said that either, is it? I think Nico Muller finished 13th in the first race as well this season or something like that anyway. But yeah, unfortunately, P13 was all Nico Muller could do in the apt car. Again, you know, qualifying difficult. The race itself was okay. Um, benefited from the higher rate of attrition than we've seen in previous races so far. And ultimately, here he is finishing P13. Is that the best the apt can do? I would say so, yeah. I do think Mahindra, of course, and apt are pretty much on the same level playing field. They've both got the Mahindra powertrain in the back of them. And uh, yeah, I do think the Mahindra is slightly more worse. I don't, I don't know how I could have worded that any more wrongly, but I don't feel that the Mahindra is quite as good as the apt. Um, so I don't think everything's quite working at apt at the moment. I think there's more in that car, whereas I think Mahindra's at its limit. Uh, but that being said, you know, uh, Nico Muller, a solid result, P13. Um, yeah, I, I think it deserves a solid seven. You know, we know it's not a point-scoring car regularly by no stretch of the imagination. And I do think, of course, that Moltara getting the five-second time penalty benefit from Jake Dennis, of course, means it's two places between the two of them instead of one place that it would have been. So, you know, mitigates that somewhat as well. But yeah, unfortunately for uh, Nico Muller, doing all he can with the car he's got, there might be a little bit more in that apt car, but they've not quite got the uh, setup nailed down right. Not a regular point scorer, and P13 is decent. And again, just keep it out of the wall, keep getting the mileage in, points will come. But for now, 7 2 Nico Muller. Next up, we come to Antonio Felix da Costa. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. And once again, avoids a lotterer of the week by this much. By the thinnest of margins. I was looking at it going, oh, shall I? Because once again, it's a poor performance. But then I sort of looked and thought, well, no, because Verline's still not got inside that top five that I said I would award uh, a lotterer of the week to da Costa for if Verline got inside that top five and uh, De Costa was outside the point. So I've avoided it just. He has just avoided it. Uh, but again, a poor performance. Poor qualifying, 21st and last. It's just not acceptable, is it? I don't know what the hell's gone on. Um, yeah, he's gained a few places to get up here, but most of them were because of retirements. And it shouldn't be this way. You know, this car is, is a championship title fighting car, and he's picked up nil point. You know, even... Verline with a difficult race still picks up a few points. Yeah, I don't know what's going on with Acosta, but he really is becoming the new Andre Lotter, and he needs to seriously book his ideas up because he can't keep being this generous. It's only that we're in the first few races finding out the pecking order that he's avoided pretty much a total clean sweep of three out of three lotterers. Um, it's not been impressive at all, has it? So for now, Antonio Felix da Costa is getting in a very generous two. A very generous two, Antonio. He's a great guy. He's a great character. I've been watching the... Uh, Net, uh, Formula E Unplugged where they've been talking about him and, and his resurgence with Porsche last season and the win that he needed and and I thought, you know what, he's a great guy, he's a champion in Formula E but something is just not quite gelling with him with this Gen 3 era and I think it's really strange how it's the, 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 the stable mates, so to speak, the ones that have been in Formula E for such a long time that are one, the ones struggling the most with the Gen 3 package. It's uh, really bizarre to say, and, and, and unfortunate as well, you know, because these drivers are the, you know, like the, the go-to heroes. If, if you were saying to someone, name someone that's in uh, Formula E, name a driver, you'd be naming the likes of Van Dorn, Bird, De Costa, De Grassi, you know, you'd be naming the Boemi, you'd be naming those. You know, there's only really Van Dorn with the exception because of the... Uh, Loyalty towards Holland and how he had the loyalty after getting kicked out of McLaren that he is like a season five starter but has got the same capabilities as what the others have in terms of like their uh, appeal towards the sport. But uh, yeah, you know, De Costa is one of those drivers that's been in since day one and again, struggling with the uh, overall package of the Gen 3. So yeah, a very generous two to De Costa for me personally. Uh, there were other drivers that did worse this race and we're going to get to them in a moment, which is why he avoids a lotterer. Uh, but he really does need to book his ideas up. Next 
Next up, we come to Nick DeVries in the other Mahindra. Uh, what can we say again? Very much just a learning few races for him. I know he's not a rookie, he's a previous champion in Formula E, but it's his first time in Gen 3. That being said, though, these last few races haven't really gone the way of Nick De Vries, has it? It's been nice not to see him uh, qualifying dead last this race, though. Uh, I think he was 15th or 16th this time around, wasn't he? So he was actually a, a little bit more decent. Uh, in the race itself, though, uh, here he is, of course, finishing outside the points. Quite a few positions behind his teammate, Eduardo Mortara, as well. I suppose, at the end of the day, the main thing is that he did keep circulating, didn't get any damage, didn't do anything silly building up the mileage once again, which Mahindra really do need to understand where they're going wrong with the powertrain, where they're going wrong with the setup of the car as well, because I do think there's a little bit more pace in that car, if possible. Uh, but it has been a rough start to De Vries' season, it must be said, hasn't it? So yeah, for Nick De Vries, starting the race in P17, finishing in P15, is nothing magic, nothing special. And uh, I think there's other drivers that are in lesser equipment or equal equipment to him, you know, the apps, the uh, ERTs, and of course, his teammate that you've got to compare him to and unfortunately he's not really delivering the goods at the moment is he so as much as it is a learning experience for him at the moment and as much as he is in a rough car it's difficult to score him any more than four points at the moment it really is uh, I'd love to have seen him a little bit more closer to his teammate it must be said uh, but in the races itself it's just not quite going his way, is it? He tends to not be able to make the progress up through the field like his teammate can. And, uh, yeah, you know, P11 for Mortara is not stunning, not staggering, is it? But it's a lot better than a P15. So, uh, yeah, uh, Nick De Vries, four points to him. Don't want to take anything away from him. Don't want to discredit him too much. But there's just other drivers that are in other cars that are still, like, sort of the equal machinery to what De Vries has got that are doing better jobs. And, uh, you know, as much as it is a learning curve, I don't quite give him the same sympathy as I would for Jahan, uh, because Jahan is a full Formula E rookie, you know. But, uh, yeah, De Vries, I'm sure it will come. You know, I think he's going to get there, and I don't want to discredit him too much. But uh, for now, it is just four points to him for that. Um, a below-average performance compared to his teammate is what I would say. And then next up, we come to the other Andretti of Norman Nato. Again, you know, another one that said that the car was absolutely awful. Don't know what Andretti had done or maybe what they'd not done. Maybe they're not accounted for the slight increase in track or air temperature or the extra grip that the track had to offer after being cleaned up, of course, uh, over an already a full day's racing. Um... Yeah, Norman Atto qualified himself down in 19th, I think it was. Here he is finishing in 16th. It's nothing special or spectacular, is it, at all, unfortunately. Did have a poor getaway as well, which didn't help Mars. I think he was last going into the first corner. Uh, so it was really, really unfortunate in that sense as well. He's getting the same score as Jake Dennis. It's three. It's three. I know Jake Dennis has obviously scored more points than Nato this season so far. Uh, but as already mentioned, Mexico was a solid effort by the pair of them just to get inside the points for both drivers. Uh... Last time out was, of course, I think Nato was being used as a little bit of a cork in a bottle. And uh, this race around, Jake Dennis himself said, thank goodness for that red flag in uh, Group 2, because otherwise I'd have been lower. And uh, Norman Nato was in Group A, of course, and was a lot lower, starting a lot further down. So, uh, yeah, I think that Andretti car had done something wrong in qualifying or done something wrong with the setup, or maybe not touched the setup at all, and that was the issue. But either way, a lot of head scratching from the Andretti squad to go away from uh, round number one with uh, a win and a fastest lap point and a P6 for Norman Nato to nil point in this one is uh, a yeah, very difficult and bitter pill to swallow. So, uh, J Jake Dennis, of course, I scored him three. Norman Nato is getting three as well. The Andretti team uh, really, really need to have a look at that one because uh, that was bad. Then we come to Lucas Degrassi in the other apt Cooper car. And, uh, yeah, Degrassi at the moment, you know, you can only ever compare him to his teammate. Yeah, he's with a new team. He's moved back to apt from, of course, Mahindra for a season. But, uh, yeah... He has been shown up by Nico Muller quite a lot at the moment, isn't he? It must be said, being out qualified, being out raced with him. Nico Muller up there singing his praises in P13, which is realistically one of the best jobs that Apt can do at the moment. Lucas Degrassi all the way down here in 17th. It is a shame, isn't it? And once again, we're mentioning that thing about the Gen 3 era and the veterans of the sport struggling to adapt. You know, there's only really Johnny Vern that's the exception to that rule, isn't there? You know, uh, Degrassi, of course, we know it's not a championship winning car, and it is a shame. My mum made a really good comment whilst watching the race. Oh, and here comes Lucas Degrassi on the commentary, and it was like, 
Oh, I forgot he was in it. You know, and that is a shame when you think about Lucas Degrassi and all he's done for the sport, even before the sport was even created, you know, doing all the testing, doing all the mileage, trying to organise the teams. He was he was like the he was doing everything at one stage in Formula E, you know, and he was really the the standout guy and the, the Mr. Formula E, wasn't he, you know? And uh, it's just been a shame to see him these last couple of seasons dropping away. You know, the Mahindra powertrain we knew was difficult last season, but he's still putting an impressive performance at Mexico to get a good podium and picked up some good points as well towards the latter stage of the season and then this season he comes into at Cooper yep yeah, okay still the Mahindra powertrain but maybe just maybe he can deliver the points and deliver the goods and I was really singing his praises in the Constructors Championship uh, prediction which uh, I'm not regretting just yet but at the moment he's just not gelling quite enough for him is it Nico Muller is the better driver of the two at the moment of course we don't know what's going on behind the scenes maybe he's doing some experimental setup work and just seeing if it works you know a bit like Lewis Hamilton at the Mercedes team in 2022 you just don't know do you what is actually going on but at the moment Degrassi just doesn't seem to have the edge over his own teammate and that's your starting point for working out how well your race weekend's gone so for Nick Lucas Degrassi it's going to be three points to him for that uh, unfortunately can't award him really any more than that Nick Hummel had a good drive this race and Lucas Degrassi just didn't unfortunately so yeah Three to Lucas Degrassi, but I really do hope this Ap Cooper and Lucas Degrassi do get inside the points very soon because it'd be great to see him do well. Then we come to the last of the finishers in this race, and it is Sergio Sete Camera. What a shame. That lap less and the fact that the track had rubbered in somewhat compared to yesterday's race meant that the the cars around him weren't going to be uh, saving their energy as much as what they did in yesterday's race so uh, unfortunately that didn't work out ERT's way we know that that car is really bad on efficiency but yesterday's race was all about maximum efficiency Norman Nato being the cork in the bottle meant that Sergio Sete Camera was able to hold on quite comfortably inside the top 10 after a stunning qualifying this time around he gets it inside the top 10 once again qualifying himself in P9 uh, stays around in that P9 area P10 area for quite a number of laps and did a really good job then we got to around lap 17 lap 18 and it all started to come undone Sam Bird nipped through on him which was the main one that dropped him outside the top 10 and then of course from that point on he was a little bit of a sitting duck there was the others overtaking him Maxi Gunter came through and a couple of others as well and then the next thing you know he's gone off the camera you know he held off from Degrassi with the battle with the app there uh, at that stage of the race then they panned back to the front again because something was happening up there and then you just watch him tumble down the order bless him as obviously the energy efficiency it was massively over consuming in, rel in relation to all the other cars and it was a case of if I don't back off now I'm not going to make the finish so yeah unfortunately becomes last of the finishers here and it is a shame to see him tumble down the order especially like I say after yesterday he was able to stay in there but with that lap less and the fact that the track had rubbed in more so the track was just naturally quicker meant that that ERT over consumed massively and he had to tumble down the order ultimately which we've seen before in previous seasons not just in the last season of Gen 3 but of course the Gen 2 era as well the Neo ERT team have always struggled with efficiency over uh, over a race distance and uh, yeah you know Sergio Sete Camera can do nothing wrong about that did all he could to hold off while he could but ultimately had to give up the fight at some stage in the race and unfortunately it couldn't show what he was capable of so for Sergio Sete Camera it's a solid seven to him not his fault that he's down here in last of the runners uh, just literally the car that he's got but once again a stunning qualifying which you can't fault him for great to see him inside the top 10 once again to prove that yesterday's wasn't a fluke it was actually genuine he did have some good pace around this circuit in in one lap fought on as long as he could to stay in, inside the points for as long as he could but ultimately tumbled down the order due to the over overuse of the car and that was that. So yeah, solid 7 Sergio Sete camera. And what a turnaround it has been for him this season. Last season I was thinking, should he really keep this seat? But at the minute, these first three races proved to me that yes he should. And I'm glad that they have because he has put in some good performances already. So let's keep these, uh, let's keep these up. Book his ideas up, you know. Hopefully over this break period, you know, we can get some more software updates on that ERT. Get some funding in the fucking team as well, you know. Let's get some money spent on it. And hopefully Sergio Sete camera can be inside the uh, jewels regularly. And maybe hold on for a, a few more points or two as the season goes by. Those two crucial points he picked up yesterday, though, are really, really crucial. Because at the moment, Mahindra and, of course, uh, the uh, apt Cooper team are on zero. So, yeah, crucial two points yesterday. But today, couldn't stay inside the points. 7-2 Sete camera. 
Then we come to the list of retirements. I didn't even know that this driver was a retirement until I looked at the uh, official standings at the end of the race after everything was declared and done and marked as official after Jake Dennis's penalty. Uh, but it is, of course, Dan Tinkton. <laughs> And there we have it, a lotter of the week to Dan Tinkton. Unfortunately, it's just been shown up these first three races compared to Sergio Sete camera. Uh, you know, yesterday, poor qualifying and didn't do anything in the race. Today, poor qualifying, knocked his wing off at the start of the race, trying to be a bit over-exuberant. Yeah, it was a Constantina effect, a load of bunching, not necessarily his fault. But once again, you think, well, Sergio Sete camera's upside, up, up there inside the top ten, two races in a row. There's another car that should be capable there. And Dan Tinkton was the one doing all the glory, or the majority of the glory last season, for the Neo squad. This season, it's very much come undone, hasn't it? You know, poor qualifying and race in Mexico, poor qualifying and race in round number two, and poor qualifying and race here in round number three, ultimately leading to his retirement. I think they probably just pulled it up due to, you know, just for saving the, the parts, really, because he'd already knocked his wing off on the first lap and had to pit, so he was already half a lap behind anyway. is isn't as if they could go under the max efficiency mode at that point, because they would have been lapped. So, yeah, a bit of a shame, really. But, uh, yeah, lottery of the week to Dan Tinkton, because because, you know, Sergio Sete Camera at the moment is just doing overall a lot better job than him. You know, Mexico was a dud. Sete Camera didn't make the start. But, uh, you know, Dan Tinkton didn't really do anything impressive. And then these last two races, it's all been about Sete Camera. Where's Dan Tinkton been? At the back. So, yeah, um, Dan Tinkton, a lottery of the week. Next up, we come to Jahan Daruvala. Oh, no. I was gutted for him. I really, really was. Uh, what could be said? A rookie season, you know, he was lucky. He was the one that was lucky in that group qualifying that uh, Bohemi crashed when he did. But at the same time, he got the lap in when it counted. And that is what it's all about. Lining himself up in P5. He maintained P6 throughout most of the race. He was doing a really good job in that uh, in that pack, it must be said. Yet, he was slightly over-consuming compared to the cars around him. But that's understandable, being a rookie. Uh, you know, maybe he wouldn't have made the end at that pace. or would have had to drop back. Um... He was then running in P7 for quite a while and he liked to take his second attack mode and you could tell the inexperience came in a little bit when he went for that attack mode because he went in very gingerly and like really made sure he was on the points. You know, everyone else that went for the attack mode lost one or a maximum of two places. Jahan, sadly, unfortunately, was definitely making sure he got the attack mode and went through all the zones where he got all the beeps to activate the attack mode and... Uh, yeah, unfortunately he lost three, so tumbled to 10th. His teammate Maxi Gunter was then behind him, so they elected to do a team order swap, let Max go ahead for the cars after him, and uh, Jahan Daravella was in conservation mode, then saving the energy whilst running around in P11, just outside the points, unfortunately. Benefited and got himself back into P10 after Sam Bird tagged the wall on all his own, and was running around in P10, was coming under pressure from behind, admittedly, and then we saw a lock-up from him and a run wide at turn 18, the move where uh, Mitch Evans tried to make all the moves. So went off, unfortunately, at that point. And we were, I was gutted for him at that point because I thought it was a mistake. But unfortunately, at that in that time, it's very rare that Formula E cars lock up due to the regenerative braking program that is set on the car. You know, they want to regen and stick some energy back in the battery. Uh, that was the start of his regen issues, which saw him retire just a couple of laps later at the same corner, funnily enough, where he just full-on locked up and the car just went straight on. Regen issue, brake failure. That was it. It was game over for him. So, yeah, a big shame. I don't think points would have been possible, unfortunately. And, you know, I, I think he cost himself a few positions there with that uh, really slow attack mode to make sure he got them. Again, just a little bit of an experience, but he wanted to make sure he got it, you know. Uh, he was running around well, though. Again, you know, defending well, driving well. And I said I wanted to see an improvement on him, didn't I? From yesterday's race to today. And I think we saw that. We really, really did. Unfortunately, he is a retirement, though, so I can only score him a maximum of five points. And I would love to give him more, but that is my rule. And I don't want to go breaking it just yet. Um, yeah, Jahan Daravella deserved more, though, that race. And uh, unfortunately, just missed out. So, yeah, five, two, Jahan Daruvala. And then we come to Sam Bird. <laughs> And a lottery of the week to Sam Bird as well. Oh, what a shame. What could be said? A tough qualifying for him, admittedly, compared to his teammate. Down in 12th, I think he was, to start the race there. 
and in the race itself was actually making good progress up through the field and was as high as eighth then. He was in eighth place, looking like he was going to hunt down the car's head. And you think, wow, could be some good points here for McLaren. You know, Jake, Jake Hughes is up there in the top five. Sam Bird's on his way. P8 could be gaining more. And then just tagged the wall at turn eight. Broke his suspension and tumbled to the back of the grid and into retirement in the pit lane. What a huge shame. What a huge shame and a missed opportunity for Sam Bird and for the McLaren squad to pick up yet more points. So, yeah, unfortunately, we can only seem to score points with one McLaren at the moment at a time. We can't get a double points finish under his belt at the moment. But, uh, yeah, frustrating. Sam Bird, you know, poor effort. In fact, a good effort, but a silly mistake. You know, it's no need. No need for these silly mistakes. So, yeah, Sam Bird, lottery of the week to him. And uh, I hope he books his ideas up for Sao Paulo because he had good pace in that race again. But it's just these mistakes creeping in, isn't it? We've seen it now. We've seen the full set of Sam Bird, haven't we, already in the first three races. Poor pace, Mexico. Good race in round one, Diria. Round number two, Diria, here. Good pace, making progress after a difficult qualifying. Bang, in the wall. Inconsistent. So yeah, uh, Lotter of the Week 2, Sam Bird. And then last, but by no means least, the driver that didn't even start the race, it is Sebastian Bawemi. <laughs> It had to be, didn't it? It had to be. It had to be a lottery of the week to uh, Sebastian Buemi. And I was mentioning with Robin Frites what a turnaround in fortune for both Envision drivers. Uh, Sebastian Buemi went P2, P12, wall. And uh, Robin Frites has gone wall, P10, P2. So very, very equal, but just the wrong way around. And they should have both been uh, scoring points in every race this season so far. Uh, Buemi. Stuffed it in qualifying into the wall heavily. Damaged the chassis, was unable to take the start of the race due to the amount of damage he sustained with the car. Um, yeah, changing the chassis is an overnight job, not a three-hour job that they had in between qualifying and the race. And they had to get the car back as well. So by the time they got the car back, they got like two and a half hours left. It was a no-go. It was impossible. And uh, that was all down to Sebastian Boehme massively missing his braking point. He said someone was in his ear talking to him as he got to the braking point. Now, I'm sorry, but a driver with that level of experience that's been in Formula for so long since the start of the season um, you know it's it's not an excuse is it a rookie you know first time in a formula car maybe someone talking to you distracts you but you just zone out surely surely you just zone out like listening to the radio in your car you're either listening to it and singing along or you're not you're not hearing it and you don't hear it you know I, I don't I don't get it but yeah unfortunately for, for Sebastian Boehme in the wall and out big big damage and a big big shame but yeah lottery of the week to him so anyway then guys, those were the runners and riders of the Diria e Prix round number two, of course, for this weekend. Round three total in the championship. Let me know down below, do I score any drivers too high, any too low? The updated scoreboards with the scores I've just awarded are on the screen now for you to take a look at. Have a look and see where your favourite driver is. Can you see him going up? Can you see him going down? Nick Cassidy leads the main championship and he's out in front in the Cruel Room championship as well. What a fantastic effort by him this season so far. I hope it continues for him. Mitch Evans needs to book his ideas up, Antonio Felix de Costa certainly needs to book his ideas up and there's uh, plenty of lotteries of the week already being thrown around um, yeah, very interesting to see how the rest of this season pans out, we've got a bit of a break now haven't we, but uh, we'll be back and we'll be better than ever when we rejoin after a few weeks away, uh, massive thanks as always goes out to Dan, uh, formerly of Mushy Gaming, currently running under his own name, Dan Bala, for providing me with the scoreboard that you see on your screen now without him this series will be more pointless than it already is so thanks a lot for watching, guys. I'll see you all in a few weeks' time. In fact, it's many weeks' time, isn't it? Uh, until the Sao Paulo e -Prix. Thanks a lot for watching. Thanks for your continued support with the series. And remember, drop a comment in the comment section below about Formula E. Like and be subscribed to the channel for your chance to win the Neo 333 presentation model of Season 5 that you saw at the start. I will contact you in the comment section. I'll reply to a comment and also pin a comment with the email on which to contact me to uh, send me your address. And I'll send it in the post if you're the winner. Thanks a lot for watching guys and as always, much love.